From New York, Clinton and Cornwallis sailed with an army of some 8,500 men, and I know the figures vary. I've seen them as little as 7,000. I've seen them as many as 12,000. It just depends upon your source. But at about 8,500, that's still a very large invasion force. The fleet had gotten together off the coast of Georgia. They had rendezvoused there. It wasn't any secret what the British were doing, but they landed troops on South Carolina soil without a single shot being fired. There was no opposition to the British landing whatsoever. And as soon as the troops had been landed, the fleet sailed to Charleston Harbor and successfully blockaded it. Nobody was going in of the harbor sailing in, nobody was going to uh, sail out. General Lincoln made the decision, probably at the insistence of civilian authorities in South Carolina, to defend the city. If you read Cornwallis's memoirs and those of some of his officers, as they slog, it took him almost six weeks to get to Charleston, to the bank of the Ashley. The rivers, the swamps, the natural defenses that could have been used to defend the city were not. As after the city fell, which eventually it did after a very traditional siege, Ingrid said, well, it was like putting a stopper in a bottle. Because Charleston, of course, folks, is on a peninsula. And if you, if you fortify the peninsula, which is what Lincoln did, all the British had to do was blockade the harbor, move their troops around, and begin a traditional siege warfare, which they did, very, and just eventually bombard the city, and on May the 12th, 1780, 5,500 American men in uniform surrendered to um, Lord Cornwallis and Sir Henry Clinton. And that included, by the way, most of the Virginia line, which was in Charleston at the time. After Charleston surrendered, so did the American forts in the rest of the state. Charleston was a disaster for the American cause. Up until Charleston, yes, losing Savannah was bad, but America kept saying, look what happened at Saratoga. Well, after Charleston, memories of Saratoga in terms of public relations were wiped off the map. You have just lost what the imperial press would talk about, this, the conquest and complete reduction of this opulent, populous, and very important colony of South Carolina. Part two of the plan is going just like it should. To many Carolinians, the American cause seemed lost. In a letter to Lord Germain, Secretary of State for the Colonies, Clinton wrote, there are few men in South Carolina who are not either our prisoners or in arms with us. But in six weeks, all of that would change dramatically as the British occupation of South Carolina began to unravel. And it unraveled first at a little settlement area on the border of the two Carolinas called the Waxhaws. Colonel Abram Buford with his Virginia Continentals was marching south to relieve or reinforce Lincoln in Charleston. He heard about the surrender. He turned around and was marching back uh, north when his uh, 200 men were overtaken by Bannister Tarleton and his legionnaires. And there, those 200 men tried to surrender, and many were cut down and stabbed, bayoneted, sabered in, in cold blood. This gives rise to what is called in the deep south part of the colonies, in the two Carolinas, Tarleton's Quarter. You know in the 18th century, if you were surrendering, you asked for quarter. Well, the Americans asked for quarter, and it was not given. And so in many a description, a diary, or a letter, in the conflicts, whether it's a, a major battle like King's Mountain or whether it's a small skirmish at Thickety Ford or Cedar Springs, when the other side tried to surrender, frequently the reply would be, you will get Tarleton's quarter. Tarleton's brutality and that of the British Army of Occupation turned what seemed to be a conquered province into a hornet's nest. Now, Cornwallis had some other successes after uh, Charleston. Clinton sailed back to New York, leaving Cornwallis in charge. The Battle of Camden. General Gates, newly installed commander of 
the army in the south is pushing his troops to meet with the British. He wants a quick victory. Cornwallis is pushing north to go after Gates. They stumble into each other in Camden. Uh, the American, it should have been, Gates really should have withdrawn. He didn't. He forced the battle, the Continental Line held, the militia did not, and it was a rout. Nobody ran faster, sadly, than did General Gates, who didn't stop till he got to Hillsborough. His men called him Galloper Gates. <laughs> now, I know he's a hero of Saratoga, but he was not the hero of Camden. Two days later, at a little place called Fishing Creek in South Carolina, not one of General Thomas Sumter's better moments, he was caught with his men and routed again, tracked down and surrounded by Tarleton, and uh, Sumter literally escaped by a hair's breadth to, in turn, raise an army again, much to Cornwallis' frustration. Two weeks after Sumter had been defeated, Cornwallis is writing to Clinton saying, the indefatigable Sumter has raised another thousand men. He was a great recruiter. <laughs> 